from Krypton Radio and the creators of the Hanging With Web Show. It's the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Look inside and behind the scenes to one of the most enduring and beloved sci-fi worlds. Step inside the door to a world that's bigger, brighter, and beyond imagination. As you become a part of the legend of the traveling TARDIS. And now, your host, Christian Basil. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Welcome for landing on another episode of the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS radio show. I'm your host, Christian Basil, and we've got something sciencey for all you science people out there. We got a special guest, Dr. Geek himself. But first, before we get to Dr. Geek and I introduce him, let me introduce the panelists. They're going to be here talking sciencey and the science of the Time Lords. We're going to start with Jessica. Let me let me let the gang introduce themselves for once. Jessica, how you doing there? Jessica Womack. Hello. Hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jessica, and your cosplay. Yes, I am a cosplayer. Um, use the tag on Instagram of Song Swan Cosplay. You see I what do, I did? Uh, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> so you don't have to mess up <laughs> I don't have to put you my, that <laughs> my Instagram title anymore. Now I get to mess it up. No. Um, yeah, I do a bunch of different um, nerdy cosplays, including River Song and uh, hopefully some other Doctor Who ones to come. But yeah, good fun stuff. I want to introduce my other panelist, Mackenzie Fleur. You may know her work, The Right of Wands. How are you doing there, Mackenzie? I'm doing well. It's too bad that we don't have any picture this time because I actually am <laughs> holding my book in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. No free promo for you. No, no promo for me. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll be back. We'll be back on Twitch eventually. We're just working out some bugs there. And speaking of back on video, we also have another good doctor, Dr. Freedom himself, Brian Burress. Brian, how you doing there? Oh, hanging in there, folks. I'm Dr. Freedom. I have a small YouTube channel. Come on over, see if you want to le- if you want to see the latest in Dr. Who news. Also, we have the Dr. Freedom and Eric audio plays if you want to sit in and listen. So feel free to come on over. So that's right, folks. And make sure not only do you hit that subscribe button, you have to hit that bell button. Uh, YouTube is really getting obnoxious about how you want to follow your friends there on YouTube. So also, if you uh, check us out, um, Garrett, who runs the Hanging with Web Show and the Wet Hanging with Web Show umbrella series of all the podcasts over there, um, it's on a separate page. It's called the Independent Creators. Help me out here, Garrett. Oh, he's coming. The Independent Creators Network. The Inter- Independent Creators Network. We are a conglomeration of a bunch of podcasts, and you can catch the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS radio show there if you're somebody who just follows on YouTube. You can also check out all the others, our Indie uh, Music Spotlight special with the Hanging With Show, and also the Hanging With Show itself, and the CW, the CW's DC Justice Watch Tower. Definitely want to check out all these podcasts. But speaking of which, we have a special guest speaking of podcasts. It's a gentleman by the name of... He goes by Dr. Geek, but I know him as Scott Begay. Hello, Dr. Geek. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. Hey, Christian. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. We're going to be talking science Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your show, uh, Dr. Geek's Lab. Sure. Well, I'm Dr. Scott Begay. I am an attorney, an archaeologist, an actor, an author. Uh, and I created Dr. Geek's Laboratory of Applied Geekdom. It is a full cast radio show dedicated to STEM outreach, uh, all very family friendly, uh, and where we explore science from fiction. Uh, and over the years, I've done that and uh, created a, a uh, an actual traveling show. Speaking of traveling tortoises, mm-hmm. uh, the Dr. Geek Science Fair, where we actually do live events and so forth. And I've also been uh, a guest panelist and, and uh, guest of many conventions throughout the United States. Uh, for the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who, uh, the entire cast came to Gallifrey One and did the science of Doctor Who. And that was great because apparently everyone cosplaying Osgood showed up. And <laughs> we, we were very popular with the Never lab coat enough. and scarf uh, set. So, yeah. Uh, so that's who I am. 
Awesome, awesome. Well, welcome to the program, Dr. Geek. Thank you for bringing on your brain, because we're going to pick that in just a moment there. But first, speaking of what Dr. Freedom mentioned, the news, we have the new... I'll never say it right. For you can do it. To save my life. The new, new news. <laughs> Sage, yes, yeah, Sage, please play the music before I just... <laughs> Now, here's an interesting fact. Brian, or, or Dr. Freedom, is laughing his butt off on because we can see each other right now. <laughs> He's going like, he'll never get it right. He'll never get it right. <laughs> he'll never get song swan cosplay right. <laughs> there you go. And it's time uh, for the Who Knew News. The Who Knew News. That's exactly right. So I have some fun stuff. Awesome. This one I thought was so interesting. Um, it came from uh, Cornwell Live. Um last week and it was that the original Dalek from Doctor Who was saved from an extermination because they found it in someone's shed. They said Cornish shed, which I just thought was funny. Um, it, okay. it has been since experts doc from Doctor Who have now uh, said that it's a fan copy and not an original. But this guy opened his dad's shed after his father passed away and was scared because he found a full size Dalek. Um, from, from the original Doctor Who series. Um, it's on display um, at the Lascard uh, District Museum out there. But how fun would that be to go out into your shed and you're looking through some old things and there is the Dalek just sitting over in the corner because now, you know, it, it has its catchphrase and, and everything. So that must have been very fun. I don't think I'd be too worried. I think I'd be more worried if that thing came to life and started just blurting out exterminate. Then I would run like heck. I, I, I don't. What do you, what do you think, Doctor Freedom? If you saw that, it, you know, you just open your garage one day and boom, there's a Dalek. What would you do with that? Hey, you, go fix the lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> do something useful. Plunge the toilet. You got a plunger? You can do it. That's, sell it on eBay. <laughs> oh boy. Well, uh, things you don't want to sell on eBay though is if you happen to go to MegaCon in Orlando this year, um, they have announced that David Tennant and Billy Piper will be at MegaCon, and they will be signing um, for autographs. They're there um, May 17th and 18th, which is a Friday and Saturday, and that is at the Orange County Convention Center. So, woohoo! I'm totally digging that. And when I saw that announcement, Jessica, you're coming with us to uh, uh, to. Uh, be there to represent the team. What, what what did you think when they announced that? And it's not my first time I've actually seen them together, too. Yeah, no, I was excited to get to um, see them again because I saw them when they came together to Tampa. Yeah. They had come to the MegaCon Tampa, like the first year they did MegaCon Tampa. Um, and it was so much fun. Um, he was swamped. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, uh, great there. I'm, I'm like really excited to see all the Whovian cosplayers though. So if you're a cosplayer and you're a Whovian, come out because I see it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's David Tennant and a lot of fangirls and in some cases some of the fan guys going up to this big boy. So yeah, and I actually have a picture. I actually went up with him to the traveling TARDIS, and I wish I could get, tell you guys some stories about the a few. I have quite a few doctors. That I've taken pictures with. And I want to thank Jessica. By the way, I'm doing this off of the side. And I want to thank Jessica. If some of you had a chance over at Pensacon, I could not be there. But Jessica took the traveling TARDIS, took some great pictures. And on the bottom of the traveling TARDIS, which the bottom has fallen out uh, by my mistake, uh, I've kept that to use that to have the doctor signed so that all the only the doctors are allowed to sign this. And this is actually representing being there. Their, it's their TARDIS. So Jessica got Colin Baker and Peter Davison uh, signature out there, but I've got their pictures as well. But I actually took a picture with uh, David Tennant with the traveling TARDIS, had him hold it in his hand, and he looked at me just like, aren't you going to be in the picture? And I said, no. And he, he just froze for like a good two minutes and like, you, you don't want to be in this picture. And I said, that's not how it works. I don't want to be in the picture. So he had, he didn't know what to do. And then he did his typical stance. He held it there. And if you guys check it out, it's under, um, the traveling Tardis and friends. Uh, he, the traveling Tardis has been with a lot of celebrities, but David Tennant, you got to check him out because he just, it was one of those, like, I don't know what else to do. Boom. Took the picture. And that's what I got. <laughs> Peter Bacaldi, Peter 
Capaldi will always be the best one on the on the list there. What else have we got in the news there, Sage? Well, Big Finish Productions are bringing back the first Doctor's companion, Katarina, mm. for a new set of audio adventures. Um, so also in uh, these early adventures, you're going to see two of the Doctors. Uh, mm -hmm. First Doctor and Second Doctor will be meeting on a mission to alter the course of time forever. Yes. Now, here's the thing. For those of you who are not familiar with Classic Who, especially the First and Second Doctors, Katarina is arguably, some people argue that she's not a companion because she was only technically in one episode, but she has been dubbed the first companion to ever die in the series. And not only just die, she 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 was trapped in an airlock with someone and to to get rid of the person, she actually ejected herself into space. And at that moment, I heard the audio. You can actually find it on Facebook. I heard the audio of this. And my goodness, I meant it's just, wow, okay, they actually let this happen on Doctor Who. But after you've seen so many companions at this point pass, when you go through like people like Adric and, and well, technically not technically Donna Noble because she came back for a little bit and, and some other companions who have died over time, you know, the Katrina one is really an interesting one because she's not supposed to be in this story because she's dead. But somehow or another, one and two come back and she's there with uh, the first Doctor. So this is going to be an interesting big finish. And not only that, but classic Who people, uh, Peter Purves is playing the first Doctor and uh, Fraser Hines is going to be the second Doctor, and they 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 are spot on with it. They are so good about uh, uh, emulating those two roles there. So it's going to be interesting how they're going to do their take there. So what else we got in the news, Sage? Well, I only have one last small thing. Speaking of audio, um, using the surviving soundtrack, there has been a restored version. Um, for the Macra Terror, and yes. you can you can catch um, you can catch that for the for the animated classic, and also because that's going to be due out on uh, DVD and Blu-ray um, March twenty fifth, and GamesRadar.com is actually running a fun little thing right now. You can win a copy um, mm -hmm. on Blu-ray. All you have to do if you go to their website is to answer one question, and that's which David Tennant episode featured the return of the Macra, and it's a drop down menu. I did not peek at it to tell anybody what you get to pick from, so you have to go to the website yourself, but you could win one of five copies that they are giving away. And everybody believe me, it's Fear Her. Just because I want a good chance to win this, it was Fear Her. Fear Her. Just remember to put that down. <laughs> All righty, folks. Well, thank you, Sage, for the news there. When we come back, we are going to be talking about the, the, the science of Dr. Who, the science of the Time Lords, with our special guest, Do uh, Scott the Gay, uh, Dr. Geek, when we return and hashtag always, well, hashtag become part of the legend. We'll see you when you get back. Authors, filmmakers, producers, anybody that has anything to do with creating independent stuff, comic book authors, musicians, make sure you take advantage of the 2019 Indie Originals Live Talent Competition going on now at www.indieoriginalslive.com. This is your exclusive opportunity to become an official award-winning independent creator to use that in your marketing. Enter today at www.indieoriginalslive.com. Who's who? What's hot and what's not? 2019 saw some amazing new creative talents, and now you can peek behind the scenes at the hottest indie creative artist in this year's edition of 25 Hottest Indie Authors, Artist Advocates 2019 Magazine, published by the renowned And I Thought Ladies. This is a one-of-a-kind look into the brightest rising stars in the creative universe. Get yours today at magcloud.com and at andwethought.com. The Rite of Wands. One boy, one right. And a world of deadly secrets that could change the course of history forever. It's time for The Rite of Wands by Mackenzie Floor. When a horrible fate reveals itself during the Rite of Wands ceremony, Myrda must find a way to change his destiny. Forbidden from revealing the future, he is granted a wand and magical powers in order to save himself and those he loves. But Myrda is not the only one with secrets. The Rite of Wands by Mackenzie Floor. Available on Amazon.com now. Discarded by Michael J. Allen In a world where magic is sold like designer coffee, unknown forces have corrupted it, 
and it's killing people. Now, an unlikely hero emerges. A homeless ex-con creating spells out of a trash can is the only one who can save the city. Michael J. Allen's Discarded, available on Amazon.com. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Legend of the Traveling Tardis Radio Show. My name is Christian Basil. We are here with Mackenzie, Dr. Freedom, Jessica, and our special guest, Dr. Dr. Geek himself, uh, Scott Vigay. Scott, welcome. Thank you for the show. Thank you for coming on to the show. And uh, this is always something I've always wanted to talk about is the science of Doctor Who. And what has there anything that Doctor Who has made? And I think... I would like to think that the sonic screwdriver has somehow made its fruition into society somehow or is coming out of there. But I think more uh, more Star Trek stuff has really exploded out from uh, f- from material that we have now, like cell phones and and stuff like that. So what 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 has come from Doctor Who that's come to its fruition? Oh, well, you know, that's a, a, a kind of a complicated uh, question there, because like you said, I think that there are plenty of inventions that were inspired by Star Trek where the inventors have actually said so, like the cell phone, like the three and a quarter inch fl- uh, hard floppies and so forth. Uh, but I think that um, there are most certainly things that have shown up in Doctor Who that people are working on, mm-hmm. uh, such as invisibility or using sound wa- uh, waves to manipulate tools. Uh, actually, you know, a what is being dubbed the real life sonic screwdriver. Mm-hmm. That looks like a um, a twenty gallon uh, aquarium that you would find in some kid's bedroom. <coughs> it's just it's this massive, big device, right? You know, it's not like oh, here, let me pull it out of my pocket and you know help you with right. that. This is a big, big device. But there are actual. Um, research into using sound waves to manipulate uh, objects. And, you know, as it gets better, I could definitely see uh, surgeons using something like this if you to pull a doctor reference. Uh, I, you know, right now there's a lot of robotic assist surgeries uh, and orthoscopic surgery and so right. forth. So if they have the ability to uh, use sound waves to manipulate small little objects, uh, it would probably be uh, very, very useful. And so we're uh, quite a ways away from being able to use a sonic screwdriver to do uh, basically everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, the, the basic technology of using sound uh, is is sound, <laughs> if, you, if you will. Well- I, I don't know if you guys ever seen this, but I did see the picture of the quote unquote sonic screwdriver. And at some point I was looking at it and I was going, you know what? I'll just get a screwdriver and use <laughs> this gargantuan football long feel. I mean, it looks like, I guess, a, a giant iron lung, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it's just huge round circular thing. But I like the the ingenuity of the sonic screwdriver. But um, let me. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that. I I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the popular things from Doctor Who uh, have definitely made an impact uh, on society as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, people will be able to connect the dots that way. I I think that the big difference between the inventors of the cell phone and so forth that deliberately uh, evoke Star Trek is because Star Trek was science fiction for the most part through and through all the time. Doctor Who can be a wibbly-wobbly a mix of anything in the world. You know, it's science fiction one year, it's horror another year, it's a fantasy another year, and it's a complete and total fairy tale uh, for about five years. And then it switches again. So it all depends right. on what you do. So depending on that, it's kind of hard to uh, to say this technology or this science uh, it develops out of, a, uh, out of this particular era. It all depends on what they're trying to, to achieve. And that's actually funny that you mentioned uh, just something that you said. We're actually going to revisit that on the uh, the Traveling TARDIS poll that we had people take later. So we'll bring that up later in in the show there. But doc, Dr. Freedom, you're going to have to go with me. Remember when the sonic screwdriver was a sonic screwdriver and that's all it was before it became the MacGyver switchblade of all trades and such like that, before it could heal people, before it could... you know. I just remember the episode where in the war games, he's showing a guy how it works. The screw came up and the screw went down. Now it can do anything. And I I think it's kind of lost its, um, 
it's novelty in the sense that it now it's too easy, even though it doesn't work on wood. But but Doctor Ge- uh, uh, Doctor Freedom, what do you think about that? Do you think they've just taken it to a to a level, or do you think that it's just now a, a, a mulligan that should, you know, for a better term, that it's like, oh, okay, well, we couldn't write this plot, so now we have the Sonic do this. Oh, heck, I remember when it was a door handle all the way back in Inferno. I was like, <laughs> all it did was open the door, you know, that Right, pop. exactly. And, yeah, of course, yeah, it, it, it screws and it unscrews. That's about it. But now <laughs> it can take life signs. Now it can dry your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> it slices and dices and makes Julian fries. Well, right. it has become a bit of a MacGuffin, but I think they mainly did, did that because it acts as a shortcut. You know, for, you know, a lot of complicated things, you need to get the doctor in and out of, boom, here's a sonic screwdriver. Do it for you in a couple seconds, whereas it could take pages doing it in another way. Right. And I think that's what happened, is that's why it evolved into a MacGuffin that it has, is because, you know, it's just basically a shortcut now. It's an easy way to get around certain plot devices. So... There you, you go. Said, you said McGuffin. Right. I said Mulligan. Okay, go ahead, yeah, it's Des. Go ahead, Des. Also, oh, the fact that we, in a, from science day, have learned the different things that sound well. There are a lot more that have been discovered since then. Yeah. Uh, we thought there that sound waves were only to do small amounts of things, but then now, like we we found that they can levitate objects if done at the right frequency. So. Is it so that it it sounds like a, oh this is a lot easier or is there, Jessica? Is I think you're using a sonic work. screwdriver on your um on your set because <laughs> your audio is cutting in and out. We'll, we'll get back to you, Jessica. I promise. No, no, it's okay. It's okay, Mackenzie. I'm equating the sonic screwdriver as of today to just lousy writing. They just couldn't get get to the point where, and you're shaking your head. I can see <laughs> it's like it's just that. Wow, it can do this now. It can do that now. And I'm just like, well, what I find interesting uh-huh. is that when the sonic screwdriver was too much of a crutch, they got rid of it. That you know, the, the classic series at one point, uh, Peter Davison, uh, I believe it's Visitation, is the last time the Fifth Doctor got to use his sonic screwdriver. And then the Sixth Doctor didn't have it at all. He had a sonic lance that lasted for one episode. Right. And and then, you know, thanks to the telemovie, the Seventh Doctor got one. And then I think it's, it's so identifiable along with the scarf and the TARDIS itself that they had to bring it back. And I, I think that at some point it became a magic wand. Uh, and, and it is a crutch, but I don't think they can get rid of it again. I think it's just too much uh, an identified piece of Doctor Who paraphernalia. You can't you can't do Doctor Who without it. And and the the um, psychic paper is another thing for that exact same reason. You know, here's my authority. You know, here I don't have time to fake I credentials. You know, I'm just gonna flash this up real quick. And uh, exactly, right? So <laughs> <laughs> what you don't see is Mackenzie just held up a book, her own psychic paper. In fact, that if you read the right of wands, you're going to look at it. It's completely blank for about five seconds. Then all the words will show up in Gallifreyan. Just yeah, exactly. Another one that's getting there is the vortex manipulator. You know, you'll notice yeah. now that you know when they had Missy come back, instead of giving her a freaking TARDIS, they gave her a freaking more vortex manipulator. It's like, come on! I thought it was supposed to be like you know hazardous to use it more in so many times, but here you go, boom, boom, boom. We're jumping all over the place. Come on. Well, I I, I like the uh, the vortex manipulator. At least I like that better than the time ring uh, that was given. You know, the, the vortex manipulator at least is a cool prop. You know, uh, but you know when, when it comes true. to when it comes to like the science of Doctor Who, I, I think I think the, the the first thing to remember is that continuity has never been Doctor Who's uh, strong point. It, it's never been what drives the story. Um, it, it it has built up its own continuity over time, but there it's never been sitting there trying to explain why things happen the way they do. Uh, you know, it, you know, we, we have an idea that that particular switch on the console does this one job, and this one lever does this thing over here. So there is some some day to day continuity, but as far as the science of Doctor Who, the great thing about it is Time Lords are so uh, far advanced that you, you end up having uh, the, uh, the, the 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 laws of fiction that tell you that any advanced technology will appear as magic. And that's exactly what ends up happening. 
Well, speaking of magic, we can't pay the bills with magical stuff or sonic screwdrivers, so we got our letter sponsors to do that. Folks, when we return, we're going to continue our talk with Scott Vigay, Dr. Geek, more about the science of the Time Lords and Doctor Who when we return. Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFF Comics. Channeling the Mothership is an exciting journey into the higher mysteries. Certified psychic medium and clairvoyant Jerry McDaniel's readings, writings, and messages have been received by thousands of people in more than 45 countries. These messages have been obtained by channeling his higher self. How does he do it? Is it a blessing or a curse? And what lay beyond the reach of your five senses? Channeling the Mothership. Explore the mysteries of the spiritual and the metaphysical. Channeling the Mothership by author Jerry McDaniel. Available on Amazon.com today. Hello, sweeties. I'm Crystal Moore. I play the Doctor in fan series Doctor Who Velocity. You're listening to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS Radio Show. From the imagination of author Kevin J. Kessler, the Roz and Annie dragons are no more. They have fallen into the obscurity of lore. Now warrior Valentine Beret and Serafina, a magically gifted princess, are on a mission to save the world of Terra. Together they must face the Roz and Annie legacy and combat the greatest threat their world has ever known. In the end, who is stronger, the man or the dragon? Find out in Kevin J. Kessler's The Roz and Annie series on Amazon.com today. Best-selling and award-winning author of true crime and crime fiction, Yvonne Mason is back with a brand new book, The Pink Canary, a book that delves into the life of a drag queen and a marvelous whodunit. You can find this and all of Yvonne's other works on Amazon.com or find Yvonne Mason on Facebook and Twitter. He's going to kill me. Buy your copy of Pink Canary now. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS Radio Show. I'm your host, Christian Basil, steering this little TARDIS of mine around through time and space. With me are Mackenzie Floor, Jessica Womack, Dr. Freedom himself. Um, keep on... Don't get it wrong, guys. I keep getting wrong between geek and freedom. That's why I've been stuttering a little bit. <laughs> Dr. Freedom, hey, hey, don't do that. Brian Barres, and we have our special guest here, Dr. Geek himself, Scott Vigay. Scott, I wanted to go a little bit further about um, the Eye of Harmony, which oh, was excellent. originally the power source of Gallifrey. But now everybody's got it in their Priuses out there in their TARDIS. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. I thought this, wait, uh, it, it used to, uh, no, wait, it's in a TARDIS. No, it's a big eye now in the TV movie. It's really an eye. Oh, is that Eric Roberts? Really? Okay. And now, <laughs> uh, after journeying to the center of the TARDIS, it, it is a black hole inside a TARDIS, which I think is actually cool. Actually, think, it is. And, and may I say that I know this is going to sound crazy, yeah. but I think that this is the, the one spot where Doctor Who really gets to shine because uh, it is the one bit of science fiction that's out there that's very popular that actually possibly got it right. Um, when it comes to time travel, there's mm -hmm. a lot of great TV shows and movies that we all love. But somehow slingshotting around the sun, I don't think it's going to send you into a time warp. Um, I don't think <laughs> it's going to be the circuits of time with a telephone booth, um, you know, make, uh, you know, circa 1980 uh, United States. And I don't think that going 88 miles an hour with a flux capacitor, whatever that is, is going to get you back in time. Uh, so what is so interesting is that uh, real science tells us, you know, and Einstein suggested that in order for time travel to happen, you had to be able to warp space and time. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that we know in nature that does that, it potentially, would be a black hole. Right. So, you know, what is so fantastic is that the, the writers 
of Doctor Who came up with the idea of the Eye of Harmony, and they came up with the idea of you know Omega and the uh, the Stellar Manipulator and the, you know and all that stuff and I, and all the the wonder, wonderful elements from the, the uh, Seventh Doctor era that kind of echoed back to it and the Three Doctors and so forth. But this idea that Gallifrey's mastery of time and space comes from their control of a black hole. Mm-hmm. actually makes a heck of a lot of sense. It's the only thing out there that actually says that's the power that you're going to need in order to make it happen. So kudos to Doctor Who. Now, as far as their application goes, well, you know, that's wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey. But, and, and, yeah, I do agree. I think it's kind of interesting that it was once a uh, black hole off, the, you know, somewhere in space, and then all of a sudden they had a relay, and then all of a sudden it was physically present inside the TARDIS. But I... I put that up to the various production teams over time yeah. trying to come, trying to come up with a way to illustrate this. And quite honestly, the TARDIS interior is this massive complex that can be endless. And why not have it be at the heart of it? I mean, it kind of – of all the wacky things I've seen on Doctor Who, this one actually makes sense to me. Well, Doctor, Doctor Freedom, growing up Doctor Who, I remember the um... – it was one of the it was one of the episodes where uh, the fourth doctor is on Gallifrey and they were discussing the Eye of Harmony. I don't even think we even get to see the Eye of Harmony in Classic Who, and then all of a sudden it makes its appearance in the TARDIS in the TV movie with Paul McGann, and it's an actual eye with reflective mirrors, which I still to this day don't understand what those mirrors are for, let alone why the thing looks like an actual eye that opens up when a human looks at it, or you know, I just I was like, what, 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 what I can't. But I've come, and then the Eye of Harmony is now in the Eleventh Doctor's TARDIS, where we actually see it, and the black hole for the first, which I think is absolutely cool, and plus the science of it. However, I've now to try to get head cannon. I consider like calling it a battery. Like there's a difference between the battery that you put in your flashlight, the battery you put in your car, and the battery that you power up a, a you know a, a solar panel system out there. There are different types of sizes, I guess, and that's how I've gotten. What? How did you get around it? Or how have you accepted the Eye of Harmony in this in, in sense? It's sciency wyancy. That, that's the only way I can think of. Because I remember, yeah, when the Eye of Harmony was originally stuck under the Panopticon on Gallifrey, and it was relayed the energy out, and yada yada yada. And then all of a sudden, yeah, the '96 movie. I'm like, what the hell is that doing there? That's supposed, that's supposed to be back on Gallifrey. Wait a minute. And then, of course, we come into the modern era, and now they're saying, okay, well, now it's in the TARDIS. But you have to remember, we thought that Gallifrey had been wiped out. Right. So the only thing we can assume is that somehow the doctor's got to have a way to have you know, good power as TARDIS without having access to the time travel facility anymore. So I think it was just a natural evolution. Plus, you got to remember, you know, science is always changing. They're always coming up with new ideas. And I think that's just how it came about is, okay, we'll just have each TARDIS powered by its own black hole and bam, there you go. It's that simple. So I, I, I think honestly that it should have been called the Eye of Omega or maybe the Eye of Rassilon. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I think they misnamed it when they came up with the Eye of Harmony. Uh, it just seems to go against uh, Time Lords and their pretentious nature uh, to always name, name things after themselves. Uh, oh, no, everything was, Mackenzie, everything was Omega, the Hand of Omega, the Eye of Omega, the Sword of Omega, the Balls of Omega. I mean, we had Omega. And it's like, there's so many body parts on Omega. How how far can we go with Omega? <laughs> what, what other thing? The colon of Omega or something. Yeah, something yeah like, the Harp of Rassilon, the Ubiad of Rassilon, Rassilon yeah. the Jock Strap right. of Rassilon. Right. right. So, <laughs> so why, why, is it the the eye of, why is it the Eye of Harmony? I don't know. But, but that's the thing that's really kind of cool about it, though, right? It's because if you're going to wheel the warp space and time and go forwards and backwards in time, then you're going to potentially need that. And I, and I also uh, like the idea that it also affects uh, mm-hmm. dimensions and, and stuff like that and, and, and how the TARDIS uh, relates to the physical world uh, and, and stuff like that. So the, the, that's where I think Doctor Who and, and science, even though it's speculative, even though it's pure theory, um, actually has maybe a toehold in something that you, know, you could actually have a discussion about as we learn more about our own universe. Mm-hmm. I'm like, like, my, oh, sorry, I just wanted to bring that. It reminds me of my favorite scene ever with the Doctor and Leela, where he's demonstrating, you know, which box is oh, bigger. Oh, right, how he explains dimensionally transcendental. Yes. I love that scene. That just did it so cool for me. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love it because it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's yeah. that, that's why I think we've lost Jessica. I think we've lost the sci-fi 
going into the new series because that when I was a kid and I saw um, when I saw the fourth doctor and Leela doing that. And I actually thought as a kid, you know what? That actually makes sense. That kind of kind of works it out. And I'm like, oh, wow, we're understanding uh, Time Lord stuff now. This is kind of cool. But it made sense. It was sci fi. It was science through fiction. And I meant, why couldn't that happen? Why couldn't the box be in that box in that same place and be over there at the same time? And I was a kid. I was like, this is actually cool stuff. I thought this was going to happen one day. But do you think the science has gone a little wonky and become more of a fantasy there, Jessica? Do you think that's... Yeah, I mean, we get... I feel like we only get one good science fiction-y episode per season, Mm -hmm. which is really sad. And I think I even said that about last season with the, the Pating. The reason I liked it was it was the closest thing to a science fiction we got out of that season. Um, and I enjoyed the science fiction aspect of it. Um, but the other aspect, like, cause I think flatline was yeah. one that actually hit on that. And yeah, it's just, it's really lost it. And they really try to throw like more magic, I guess, into it. And they're like, Oh, but magic is just, you know, science. We don't understand. And I'm like, no, but I don't think you understand it either. So, <laughs> <laughs> That, well, that I don't doesn't... think the writers know what they're talking I, about. Yeah, yeah. I, was like, I don't think the writer. I was like, talk theory with me. At least have some science basis to it. Don't just throw some random stuff and go, yes, it's just future science. You'll understand and later. Um, so, yeah, I, I do feel like we've definitely lost that touch. And like, I miss it. I really like, you know, the science portions of it. And even the anthropology apology aspects of it and i feel like we've we've hit on that in past episodes but now mm. it's really become about relationships which is great but it, it's it's supposed to be a science fiction show jessica let me reel you in a little bit there because you're not going to believe what the poll has to say and oh, we're no. getting into that territory there. Mackenzie, uh, let me do a round robin with this. Mackenzie, out of all the stuff you've seen in Doctor Who tech-wise, what is your favorite item? And I'm going to take the TARDIS out of the loop because that's just too easy. Everybody wants, yeah, exactly. Well, no. And you can't see the video, but Mackenzie's giving me a dirty look like, no, I want the TARDIS. I'm like, everybody's <laughs> going to answer that question. But of everything that the Doctor has had in his person or her person um what do you think would be the best you know if you were i guess what were they all stuck on an island what kind of device would you have on your person or may you know what just just going through life well, what's your I favorite a, if i couldn't have a magic wand because we're not talking about right of wands it's gonna have I to know. be the vortex mist manipulator <laughs> you have to strip get out your power strip she's got plugs coming <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> well what would you what would be your favorite thing um it would be the vortex manipulator. It'd be the vortex manipulator. Doctor Freedom, what's your favorite tech out of Doctor well, Who? Well, if you want out of her in a hurry, it would be the vortex manipulator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we can't have a TARDIS announce the vortex manipulator. So if not that, I'd say sonic screwdriver. At least you can keep yourself entertained zapping stuff while you're sitting there waiting to be rescued. That's true. Jessica, what's your favorite tech that's come out of Doctor Who aside from the TARDIS? Um... I mean, I've always been a sucker for the Vortex Manipulator, no matter what someone says. But I do kind of... It's not tech. It's kind of biotech, I guess. Yeah. But the hallucinogenic lipstick. Ooh. I love that thing. I really want that. <laughs> but you have to get intimate with people to use the actual item, so... Yeah, true. Or K9. K9's amazing. I, you got to you gotta love yourself a, a robot dog. Damn, I knew somebody was going to take mine. K9 was going to be mine. And in the 50s, what was it, the 51st century, 52nd century, we still cannot make a device that can't go through water, even though our cell phones in the 21st century can. So I, mean, like, I was a little like, okay. But I think that was corrected in the K9 Canadian series that they came out this. Dr. Geek, what is your favorite item that's come out of Doctor Who sci-fi wise? Sci-fi wise? Chameleon. Huh? Huh? Oh. Uh, uh. Especially if you're going to be stranded on a desert island. At least Chameleon can be everyone you could ever imagine. So you're not just limited to, you know, the one person you can interact with. Uh, uh. I, actually, uh, so that would be my answer if I was stranded on an island. I, I think the sonic screwdriver <laughs> is uh, the, the, the number one takeaway for me. Uh, actually, on Dr. Geek's laboratory, Dr. Geek has the sonic servo. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a cross between the sonic screwdriver and the servo from Gary Seven from Star Trek, uh, and it can it you know it has like three thousand uh, settings and it can do everything. And like every super tool in fiction, it has one crazy weakness: uh, it doesn't work on magnetic fields. Uh, you know, I f- figured that one because not working on wood. What the heck does that mean? It's a screwdriver, of course. Right. It work on wood. So I, I, I at least picked one for myself that was a little bit more uh, of a challenge. But what about the sonic trowel? All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, as an archaeologist, <laughs> sonic. As, as an archaeologist, I looked at that and kind of just snickered. You know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> It helps. It helps in the digging process, right? It, it sure. resonates the the particles around certain items, so you don't create damage to those archaeological finds. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I, I'm, right, <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, although I don't think it would ever speed anything up. I think you'd be sitting there and taking as much time as you used to. Yep. <laughs> And my brain went Sonic Trowel hashtag dig this. I meant it's. I, I guess you. I guess you could do it that way. I'm going to go with and uh, it, and mine would be a fully functioning chameleon circuit. Now, depending upon how I hook it up, I mean, uh, I guess to my car or something like that, that I could change it into something else or change an item into something that I needed. So, if like, well, I can't find my hammer. Push a button, boom, it's a hammer. Now I can use that because you mentioned Chameleon. And for those of you in Classic Who, for those of you who don't know who Classic Who is, it was Fifth Doctor. Uh, Chameleon could change his appearance to a robot, and I think he was good for two episodes, and then uh, he sacrificed himself, unfortunately. And I think he's actually made a comeback in Big Finish. But, um, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, but sadly, I, but when did the Chameleon... Oh. So the person that created Chameleon, who actually knew how to manipulate the uh, the prop, uh, passed away, and so they lost the ability to actually use the uh, the thing, and so that's why he got sidelined and then got rid of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He used his own machine code, and, and the, so they had no idea how to operate the prop. So that's why he got relegated off and disappeared. But listen <laughs> to the big finish audios; they are good. They are very good with Chameleon. Oh, big finish, yeah, all Chameleon, yeah. I don't think I've had one bad, bad big finish experience there. So uh, I've got the chameleon circuit going on over there. But, I but would the also... chameleon circuit only changes the outward appearance, not the interior. Correct. Yeah, but just True. imagine. You can make, just imagine, though, you can make your rusted old Volkswagen look like a Ferrari. Exactly. True. Yeah. True, but then the inside would still look like a rusted old Volkswagen. I, I guess it's a give and take because it's like, I, well, if I need... If somebody like let's say we're going to convention, Garrett, and back me up on this, or you go like Christian, we don't we don't have a stage. Boom! I press my button on my camera, and boom, it's a stage. So I mean, it turns it. So, Dude, yeah, you can make it look like Optimus Prime. Yes, that exactly. Cool. <laughs> so there's no limits right, to my right. circuit as long as it's working and it's not. That would run... be great for cosplay. Just I saying. Like, <laughs> it's not been assembled by Colin Baker there. So yes, that would be. That'd be cosplaying a chameleon circuit. That would be very, very interesting. I would like that there. There's one item that the doctor has had one time in his life that was ever used, and it's the most basic of things that I've seen him have. Um, Dr. Geek, I'm talking about his celery lapel. Oh, <laughs> yes. And and I gr- think that's tech too because it technically did come out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, what I love about it was that they finally came up with an explanation. You know, why are you wearing celery this entire time? Because that it turns a different color in the presence of certain gases that the doctor knows he's allergic to. I mean, how cool is that? And the fact that he was using kind of that green technology. I mean, that's. That's that's really cool, and I also love the, uh, Perry's follow up question. So, what do you do when it turns blue? And he looks at it and says, "I eat it." <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually not gonna, it. it's, yeah, it's, it's not actually going to do any good. But I mean, uh, it, at least it's still tasty, I suppose. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, you know good for him. He can pull off a decorative vegetable. Well, I think it's I think it's actually cool that it, it, yeah, what we call green tech. It's just something simple, something really easy, something everybody can find, and just like, oh, I could actually do that with celery. I don't know if that's actually true, but I mean, you can actually do that with celery there. Um, I just I, thought it was funny as hell. It turns out Peter Davison couldn't stand the taste of celery. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and have a little pocket full of peanut butter to dip it in in there and just eat it. There. Good grief. Poor guy. Well, I think... Um, I think the main question is, Dr. Geek, 
Yes. How far are we away from becoming Cybermen ourselves? Oh, now that is a really cool question. So hang um, on, hang on. Actually, one second before we do that, we got to pay some bills. So hold that thought, folks. We're going to be coming back here in just a moment. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here at the Legend of the Traveling Tardis Radio Show. Let's pay some bills first, and then we're going to get that answer from Doctor Geek when we come back, and we're going to do our Traveling Tardis Radio Show poll. Be right back. Stay tuned and become part of the legend. It's Germany, 1938. Charlotte is a 15-year-old girl living in the Jewish quarter. George lives in the city proper and enamored by Charlotte's charm and grace when she wanders into his cobbler shop. George decides right then and there that he is going to marry her. Follow along as this unlikely couple struggles to stay one step ahead of the Gestapo and their dramatic escape from Nazi Germany. Good things always happen in springtime. From author Joanne Fisher on Amazon.com today. Now on Amazon.com, I coin from author Jeremy Mosby. It's an alternate reality, and the leader of the planet I coin is none other than Benjamin Franklin. When corrupt officials threaten not only I coin but the Earth as well, an unlikely chosen one, Jeremy, must face dark foes to save the Earth and I coin alike. Author Jeremy Mosby takes readers on a superhero's adventure through this compelling and imaginative alternate universe. Get I coin on Amazon.com today. Every year, tens of millions of people flock to Florida for its sunny beaches and world-famous tourist attractions. Most never learn about the strange and unusual locations just off the beaten path. From the UFOs of Gulf Breeze to Robert the Haunted Doll in Key West, learn about the myths, monsters, and legends from the dark side of the Sunshine State. With author Mark Muncy and illustrator Carrie Schultz in their books, Eerie Florida and Freaky Florida from the History Press. Find them at eerieflorida.com or wherever books are sold. Now on Amazon.com, War Crawls, Love Cries, a Civil War novel by Mark Berry. Isaac Wells is an innocent farm boy living in upstate New York. His dreams are shattered by a treacherous brother and the onset of a devastating civil war. War Calls and Love Cries is a fast-moving historical narrative. It is an emotional roller coaster ride and a riveting must-read book that you will think about and talk about for a long time to come. War Calls and Love Cries is the kind of book you will cherish for a lifetime on Amazon.com today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS radio show. Thank you again for joining us and keeping tune with us. I'm hoping you're having a good time where we talk about the science of the Time Lords themselves, the science of Doctor Who. Um, Doctor Geek, I asked him a question. I put him on hold for just a second, and we're just going to leave you in a little suspense because we want to go over our Doctor Who poll because some of the uh, Doctor Geek and Jessica were hinting on of. The question on our Doctor Geek poll this week was... Um, would you say recently that Doctor Who is more sci-fi or fantasy? Uh, we did our poll, a hundred and uh, and I'm sorry, I put the poll out a little bit late, so only 167 people voted. Jessica, what percentage do you think of people think that it is sci-fi? I well, I guess it depends how people are defining sci-fi. That's a hard one, but I I feel like maybe like. 40% think it's sci-fi? 40% 40% th- think it's sci-fi. Wow. I'm 43%. Having, I'm, 43. Oh, we're getting a little dick technical. Yes. <laughs> we're putting in a back number. Mackenzie, the lovely Mackenzie, how many people think it's sci-fi versus I'm fantasy? Gonna go, I'm going to go with 60. 60. We're going up a little bit. Dr. Dr. Freedom, what's your percentage there? How many people think it's sci-fi? I was going to say about 50. 50%. Garrett, just because you're on the line, how many percentage of people do you think think it's a sci-fi over fantasy? Uh, I'm going to go with, oh, let me give people credit for more than I normally do and say about okay. 38% think it's sci-fi. 38%. So you're going lower. Okay, Dr. Geek, since you are a guest today, what do you think is the percentage sci-fi? Oh, I, I feel like I'm on card sharks. Uh, <laughs> lower. Lower. I, I think lower. it's going to be, yeah, I think it's going to 30%. 30%. The actual answer out of the 164 people who voted, 76 people still think it's sci fi versus 24%. Uh, I'm actually going to go a little bit on the stream that I bet you that percentage would be higher if we were just talking about classic who. 
Uh, I think people get confused if you see something just because it takes place in, in space uh, or on an alien planet. That doesn't make it science fiction. Uh, the stories are have been pure fairy tale for so long. Uh, I, I, you know, just because you put them in a sci-fi setting, that doesn't make it sci-fi. I mean, but maybe I'm being too much uh, uh, of a stickler. No, I agree with you. Uh, it needs to actually have science in regards to creating fiction with said science, not saying, oh, it's futuristic and spacey, so that's science, right? Yeah, no, I don't need to have actual science base. You know, I, I, science I, fiction. I, I don't need another robot that can have its bomb turned off because it loves. Uh, you know, that, that, <laughs> you, you know, it's a robot. It's my a thunder on that. device. I mean, come on now. I mean, just for once, I, I would like you know some sort of consistency when it comes to that. So no, the moment I saw that, you know, like, oh no, it's a robot. Oh no. It's going to have this bomb go off. It's okay. Tell it it has feelings, and then it'll be able, because of love, it'll turn off. Uh, nah, no, no. Check, please. I'm done. <laughs> well, Mackenzie, I'm thinking because, it, I, I mean, you could still have love as the byproduct, but it's still got to be some microbes, some kind of chemical imbalance, something that, some kind of catalyst for it to be sci-fi or else you yeah. might as well pull be pulling out a rite of wands yeah. stroking it around and saying, yeah, okay. It's love that saves the day. And I said, no, we are a sci-fi show. We are not Harry Potter. We're not the rite of wands. We are, we got to stay with the technical. And that's why I love that scene that we mentioned about the technical when Leela and the fourth doctor are, you know, he's showing how, uh, different, how the TARDIS works. And I think it has to be rooted in that or doesn't work. You can yeah. still throw in the love, but it can't be the primary thing. Uh, of course, I agree with you, Christian, and I think that you know you have to be you have to be able to have a certain amount of grounding for it to be science fiction. Right. The Earth, the, the the Moon is not an egg, and the Arbor <laughs> Day, and, and the uh, the Arbor Thank Day you. special, the Arbor Day special, where uh, all the all the uh, plants evaporate, and, uh, and my personal favorite, all the disruption to all the concrete went away too. Uh, you know. Uh, no, no, no. Doctor Who need you know. Uh, you know, I'm glad. That's why I'm glad there's always a new showrunner and new writers every so often because it gives you a chance to do some some different stories and a different take on it. Like this last season has had some really great episodes. I don't necessarily consider them science fiction, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be. Doctor Who doesn't have have to be sci-fi all the time. But if there's an opportunity to create. Uh, a reference to their technology, and I would prefer it to be more science fiction attempt mm -hmm. than what they've been doing lately. Well, I'm at uh, Doctor Freedom. Give me if I'm wrong, because uh, was it Kill the Moon? What I don't like is when it contradicts its own classic, and a lot of the new stuff is contradicting itself. Okay, what about Moonbase? What about Day of the Moon? I meant now Kill the Moon. Now the spiders, and uh, it's an egg. I'm like. Uh, how, why, how does this fit into the universe that you created and what's been out there? Now I got to believe that I can kill spiders with Lysol and, and cleaning products and I can, and uh, the moon's an egg. I meant, oh. I just tried to pretend that episode didn't happen. Doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was like, you're kidding oh, you're me. Right? About the moon the of Earth. Earth. This is the moon of Endor. <laughs> <laughs> it, right. You got, it, if, if they had picked any other moon in the universe, that'd be fine. But we actually went to the moon. Right. I, that's the problem I had. You know, I, I, I was I was actually okay with the with the spiders. You know, for a moment. You know, I was like, okay, you know, something we didn't know. Okay, something we didn't explore. All, all, all right. And, and then when it gave birth to, to something roughly the same size as the moon that it hatched out of. Right. You know, it's a turbo, apparently. Um. Oh my God! There's so many problems with that movie, with that episode. So uh, yeah. So we, and that's what makes me question that poll. I, I I don't think we are all defining science fiction the same way. I've got, I've got a little message from Sage that's saying Moon is not an egg. Moon is a goddess. It is known. So okay. But yeah, it's it, that's where I think it starts going into the fantasy realm more than it goes into its sci-fi realm because sci-fi dictates it defines it still can be the magical world and i still believe in the third doctor's interpretation of science fiction or, or science 
or in magic, it's just science you don't understand yet. I mean, simple things that people have been defining. I actually watched something last night. I forgot what show it was, but they were talking about the Big Bang and how that it could exist and not exist. And at some point they were saying, you know what, scientists cannot measure it. You know, everything was compacted into this little point and then exploded. Well, how did everything get into this little point? And there might be stuff out there that we just can't define and look at. But we're hoping that science fiction like Doctor Who can try to give us an explanation. And if they want to throw a little bit hard of it, like it, Russell T. Davis does, that's fine. But I think it, when it loses that speed, it's like, okay, so what is the moon now? Why do we? Have, what am I staring at now? Why you know is it is it Patrick Troughton and a bunch of guys up there? Is it you know something that the the moon landing that the science saw and now we're wiping out the species of the science, or is it an egg? So I'm I, I'm hoping as more and more episodes come out, we get back into the science fiction realm because we kind of lost sight in that, and I don't mind it kind of losing its sci-fi, but don't call yourself a sci-fi show. You're more fantasy now. You're more drama, which I think we've seen and discussed and debated about with Chibnall. That's the direction he's taking it in. It's kind of lost to sci-fi. The only sci-fi part is maybe there's an alien thrown in at one point with teeth on its face, or there's a time travel episode. But I meant beyond that, it could be anywhere in any given time there. Um, but I digress. Dr. Geek, how far are we away from Cybermen? <laughs> oh. Well, I guess it all depends on your definition of what is a Cyberman. Uh, uh, it, because there is a technological answer to that, and there's also a, uh, a societal one for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, at its very basic level, the fact that people will freak out if they can't log into Facebook for more than a, a few minutes, uh, then it already tells you just how important the World Wide Web is and how connected we all are to instantly being able to communicate with one another. Um, I, I think that I, I have not actually dialed a friend's phone number um, with a keypad uh, in so long. I mean, half my brain is in my phone. You know, it, it's, it, it literally has been uh, augmented. I, I don't bother memorizing any of that stuff anymore because I don't have to because my phone remembers it for me. Right. So, you know, there's already that uh, societal movement to where uh, connected devices connect us all, and that's very Cybermen. Uh, as far as the organ replacements and stuff like that go, uh, you know, there's always improvements all the time. And when it comes to prosthetics and limbs and stuff like that, the, the fact that we're now able to use 3D printers to print that and make it more accessible and more affordable is also... Um, a, a major leap forward in the use of that technology, uh, especially when it comes to kids. So, you know, uh, any, I don't know if anyone on the uh, cast here has kids, but, you know, keep your uh, kids in shoes that have to be replaced every <laughs> six months. Same problem with growing up when, and needing a, a bionic arm. So technology is definitely improving. And I think it's also interesting that, the, uh, that I was talking to the one uh, doctor, and he said that, you know, it used to be I give somebody a replacement limb, and they want it to look like a regular limb as best as possible. Now people are opting for it to look uh, and show off the technology. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it depends on, on all those sorts of things, but and the building blocks are already there. I'm going to do, uh, not a round robin, but anybody can jump in, but this question is specifically for Dr. Geek. Dr. Geek, do you really think there are a race of people out there whose sole purpose is to watch over us, and do you think they could just die and change their appearance? Ah, well... Do you think they're, they're really out there? Do, do you I think really, time... I, I, do I think Time Lords are out there? I, I think or some race similar to them. Yeah, I, I think that there is intelligent life out there in the universe. I think that, you know, it, it, the universe is a very, very big place, and we're a very, very small one. Uh, and so it would be uh, the height of hubris to, to say that we're the only thing that's out there. Um, I don't know if they're Time Lords, uh, and they have the ability to regenerate, and I don't know where they are on the scale of civilizations and stuff like that. 
but you know clearly if there is a a, a galactic center of activity we are the point farthest from <laughs> you know gotcha and i'm sorry to close this up but we're, we're running out of time sage can you give us a little bit on the convention side of things and where people can see us coming up very shortly i certainly can as everybody knows we are headed to megacon in may mm. yes the the whole shebang is going to be there. We'll we'll be having some fun at MegaCon. Uh, and let's see, coming up here soon in April, we have UltraCon in Miami. Um, you can find us there. And then we have a whole bunch of stuff as we go into summer. And as we get closer and closer, we'll be sure to let everybody know. And until then, you can find us on iTunes and Spotify and iHeart and Facebook and YouTube and Oh, just about anywhere you can imagine. And anywhere around the Hooniverse. Uh, folks, please check out Dr. Geek's Lab for yourself on iTunes. Uh, you can go to his Facebook page. Just check out Dr. Geek's Lab. Give it a, give it a like and check it out because the episodes are wonderful. And it's especially if you ever check them out, they're kid-friendly and fun for the adults as well. That's all the time that we have, folks. I want to thank Mackenzie. I want to thank the Hanging With Web Show radio team. I want to thank Jessica. I want to thank Dr. Freedom and, of course, Dr. Geek for joining us. Thank you all for joining us on Thank you for all to continue to listen. And for those who are just joining us, welcome. Uh, please keep us uh, in, uh, please keep us um, going wherever you listen to us. As Sage mentioned, iTunes, iHeart, everywhere, Spreaker, because we want you to continue to become part of the legend.